On the 18th of March, 1871, the workers of Paris took control of their city. And in a brief period of only about 10 weeks, they gave to the world the heroic example of the first worker state in history, the Paris Commune. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll amplify my voice a bit. Now, at, writing at the time in one of his letters, Marx described the Paris Commune as the Paris workers storming heaven, which is where we've taken the title for this talk today. Now, writing later on, he summed up the significance of the Commune in these words. He said, the 18th of March gave the workers the awareness of their strength. The 18th of March has emancipated them. For the first time in history, they have been able to take their destiny into their own hands. This movement is thus a revolution. That is why it has separated the water from the earth. That is why the slavers think of it only with rage. That is why all the workers of the earth welcome it as a date of liberation. 150 years later, we celebrate the inspiring achievements of the commune. We don't just mark it as a kind of religious holiday, although I think we should mark 18th of March kind of like, you know, like a communist Christmas, to be honest. Maybe not in a religious sense, as I'm saying. We must study the commune, commune and absorb its lessons because in both its triumphs and its mistakes, and also in its eventual defeat, the commune is still an invaluable guide for how the workers can overthrow capitalism and begin the socialist transformation of society. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit scared I'm going to go over time. And even then, I'm not actually going to be able to cover all of the lessons that we can draw from the commune. There are so many, and it's so ap applicable to the class struggle today. Um, but I will try my best to cover what I think are the main ones. But before I get even to 1871 and the events of the commune, I want to take us back a little over 20 years to provide a little bit of context. I haven't got much time, um, but talk, to talk about the regime the commune overthrew, um, the Second Empire. So France didn't actually live under just one Napoleon. They, they, the French ended up living under two Napoleons, Napoleon I and Napoleon III, his um, nephew, uh, Louis, Bona, uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, now, he, uh, in 1848, there was another revolution. France has seen a lot of revolutions. Engels commented it's the country in which the class struggle is always fought to the finish. And he, what he was referring to there is in 1848, like the Great Revolution before it, like the 1830 revolution, the, the, the working masses of Paris, that is the proletarians and the, the poor petty bourgeois, you know, the artisans, small business owners, they um, rose up in arms and overthrew the last monarchy of France, the July monarchy of Louis Philippe. That was in February of 1848. Later on, the workers themselves, the working class, in a Marx and Engels opinion, for the first time in history, about 300,000 workers rose up again in arms, you know, mounting barricades in the street to try and overthrow the very bourgeois democratic republic, the second republic they themselves had given birth to because they were not satisfied that it was going to provide them the social transformation that they had dreamt of and that they fought for. That uprising, not unlike the commune, was crushed in blood using artillery and grape shot and, and rifles by the, uh, the, you know, the defenders of the bourgeoisie. Following which, the nephew of Napoleon I, Louis uh, Napoleon, was elected as the first president of France, elected by universal male suffrage, by, by a majority of millions of votes. But in this period, we see a tumult, a ferocious class struggle, even though the workers have been, been put down. We see a massive shift to the left in society, not only amongst the working class, but even amongst the peasantry. And the, the bourgeoisie openly saying, writing in their publications, in their newspapers, what good is this legality in this constitution if all it gives us is disorder and revolution? That it's time for order with a capital O. An order was granted in France at that time by the saber of what, who would become Napoleon III, who took power in a military coup on the 2nd of December, 1851. We're going to mark, not so much celebrate, mark the 170th anniversary of that this year on December. And we're going to hopefully time that with the publication of a new edition of Marx's 18th Brumaire, which is a pamphlet written about those events. So one to keep an eye out as well. Um, after that period... Um, we have a, a period of relative stability in French and world capitalism, and actually a rapid upswing in French capitalism. GDP doubled in the period of the uh, Second Empire. But the reason I'm bringing this up, the reason this is interesting from our point of view, and not kind of dry economic point of view, is because it led to the strengthening, both quantitatively and qualitatively, of the working class in France. There's a comment that Ted Grant has made, and also Alan Woods in his book about the Spanish Revolution, The Great Betrayal. He talks about, he compares the working class in any country to the giant Antaeus, whom Hercules fights in his labors. Every time Hercules would throw Antaeus to the ground, thinking he'd broken his back in his, you know, their wrestling contest, the giant would get back up even stronger than before because he was drawing strength from his mother, the earth. And the working class is a bit like that, that no matter how many times the capitalists and the ruling class and the reactionaries 
throw us down. The working class always comes back stronger because capitalism, in order for it to develop, in order for capital to exist, it needs the working class. It grows the working class. It concentrates them in large enterprises and actually provide, it, it provides its own grave diggers, to use Marx's expression. And so in the same time that GDP doubled, the size of the working class in Paris went from being about 300,000 of a total population of a million, so about a third, to being over a million in a population of two million. So they became the absolute majority of the population of Paris, which has a very important bearing on what was to come later on. Um, but just to, it wasn't just that the working class got bigger after, after, being, after having been crushed violently. Then, over the next couple of decades, we again start to see a resurgence in the, the militancy, in the industrial and political movement of the working class, as we always do. So the 60s, the late 1860s, I mean, was a period of rising strikes in France at that time. In January of eight, you had elections in 1869, where this is a Bonapartist government. You know, this is a dictatorship, but they hold an election with a tame opposition. And the government, in a Bonapartist regime, only received 55% of the vote. I know that is a majority still, but this was a partly rigged election. That started to cause concern. In January of 1870, you had a mass demonstration of 200,000 people on the streets of Paris because a famous uh, journalist, Victor Noir, was assassinated, murdered by the cousin of the emperor. 200,000 people in a city of 2 million is 10% of the population. That's about the proportion of the American population that was out on the streets during the Black Lives Matter movement. So this was a serious threat, a huge movement that actually started to scare the ruling establishment. And not for the first time, certainly not for the last time in history, Bonaparte and the Second Empire decided to use chauvinism, national chauvinism, and war as a means of hopefully scoring successes abroad, but also diverting and cutting across the class struggle at home. Not unlike, really, the hopes of the Russian Tsar. You know, there was a rising class struggle prior to 1914, and he hoped that if they scored some victories abroad, that that would cut across, you know, mobilize people for the army. And very interestingly, dialectically, that can turn into its opposite very, very quickly, because war is often closely connected to re revolution. Often, what does war force the masses to do? It, it throws them out of their you know, kind of daily routine, and it forces them to examine very, very closely, as a matter of life and death, the decisions being taken by their leaders. And that applies even more in a case of defeat, again, like the Tsar in, in the First World War. The Franco-Prussian War, as it became known, so Bonaparte used the pretext of a dynastic dispute over the succession of the Spanish throne with Bismarck, the, the chancellor of Prussia, which was the most important, powerful German state at that time. He used this pretext in order to launch an invasion of Germany. And that invasion turned into a complete debacle and a disaster from the standpoint of the French armies. They were surrounded, outmaneuvered, and quite rapidly defeated. On the 2nd of September, 1870, Bonaparte himself, at the head of his army, becomes totally surrounded by Prussians, tries to shoot himself his way out, loses about 17,000 lives, this pointless charade, and then hands himself over as a pres uh, president, as a prisoner of Bismarck and the war is brought to an end. And this is when events really start getting interesting, because in two days after that surrender, the empire is dead and the Third Republic comes into being. Now, I don't have a huge amount of time to talk about how the Third Republic itself came into being, but what I can say is, not unlike the Second Republic, it was bought and paid for by the struggle of the working class. Actually, even the most left-wing radical MPs, deputies, MPs in the Bonapartist par uh, parliament, people like Leon Gambetta, actually said to the workers, when the workers heard the news of the defeat on the 3rd of December, September, sorry, they started coming out onto the streets and demonstrating. And this, you know, leader of the people, this radical Republican, said to them, in fact, I'll quote, you are wrong. They were calling for the Republic. He said to them, you are wrong. We must remain united. United with who? United with the Bonapartists and the monarchists. Make no revolution. Luckily, I would say for humanity and the, work, the working class, the workers ignored him. Luckily for the Third Republic, at least, the workers ignored his sage advice. And on the 4th of September, they came out en masse. They stormed into, I suppose, the equivalent of the House of Commons called the Corps Legislatif. They cleared out the deputies and they forced the same guy, Leon Gambetta, to announce the abolition of the empire. I think he probably did some uh, under certain duress, but he did, it, he did it. But they weren't satisfied with that. They then carried him over, the, over to the Hotel de Ville, the city hall, which has great historic importance in, in France. Many of the revolutionary announcements and new governments have taken place there. It was a key location. So they carried him over there and basically forced him to announce the proclamation of the Third Republic there and then. The reason I bring this up, the reason I think this is relevant is how many times in history, especially the history of the last century, have we seen democratic revolutions overthrowing dictatorships or the absolutist monarchies carried out by the workers or led by the workers only to give rise to a you know, a more democratic, but ultimately a bourgeois government. 
Marx described the government as a cabal of place hunting barristers. I think we know more than a few, uh, more, more than a few place hunting barristers in our own politics today. But how is it then that the workers had so valiantly risen up but given birth to this government, of, you know, this cabal of place hunting barristers? Well, let's face it, in ordinary times, the workers are quite used to being governed by their, their superiors, you know, the experts, the people who hang around the corridors of power. These people who announced what became, there was a provisional government that was given the name the Government of National Defence. These people were able to appoint themselves the government, people like Leon Gambetta, people like uh, Jules Ferbre, and other famous bourgeois republicans on the so-called left. They were able to announce their own names for the government, and the workers even cheered, because at that point there was no alternative. And caught, they draped themselves in defence in order to win the support of the workers, because the defeat to Prussia had meant that this imperialist war of aggression had turned actually into an invasion of France by Prussia. And the Parisian workers were actually extremely determined to prosecute the war and, um, and defend Paris and the rest of France from the Prussians. You might think, well, why, why were the Paris workers suddenly so interested in, in carrying out this war? The reason is, it's not simply as a result of national chauvinism. I've heard a lot in relation to British politics today that, oh, we'll never have a revolution in England because in England the workers are too patriotic and too lulled by kind of conservative mythology. Let's not be too impressionistic and too kind of empirical in our view of the changes in moods and the mood that exists within the working class. The kind of veneer of chauvinism that existed in, in Paris at this time, actually it was them wanting to defend the Republic. They had no interest in defending the Second Empire, but at this, Bismarck had no interest in allowing a democratic republic to exist on the other side of the Rhine. He wasn't at the head of a democratic republic. Um, and the majority of the bourgeoisie in France, in fact, were monarchists at this time. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the history of monarchism in France, but in fact, there were two monarchist factions, an Orleanist faction, which supported the more recent July monarchy, and a legitimist faction, which supported the old dynasty of the Bourbons who had been overthrown in the Great French Revolution, and again in 1830, but they just didn't, couldn't have enough. They wanted them back. And so these two quarreling bourgeois factions actually represented the majority of the ruling class. So for the French working class in Paris in particular, this government of national defense was to them a defense of the Republic. But crucially, how many times have we seen the bourgeois leadership of this new you know, democratic revolution are utterly incapable of carrying out even the most basic tasks that they have been assigned? The most basic task assigned for the government of national defense, I think you could probably tell me what that was, it was defending the country, defending the nation. And yet they completely failed. Marx referred to them as a government of national defection. Now, why? Again, I'm a bit hard pressed for time, but there's an important class reason. And this is a great vindication of the class view, the Marxist view of history, because I think without a class outlook, it just doesn't make sense for the government of a country to deliberately or, or negligently just allow a powerful Prussian army to besiege their capital. And yet it happens. And the, the majority of the French troops had been captured or, or were already tied up in the, the war itself. So that might be an excuse. OK, they didn't have an army to fight. But they did actually have a fighting force of 250,000 armed men within Paris itself. It was called the Paris National Guard. The National Guard has actually been created back in the Great French Revolution. Its purpose was basically just as a militia in the various cities. Back in the time of the French Revolution, back in the time of 1848, the, the National Guard was largely bourgeois in composition. They bought their own outfits. They, they were really proud of their bearskin hats, like the, like, like the Palace Guard in Buckingham Palace. Uh, they weren't necessarily revolutionary. And actually, they, they shot at and put down the workers in 1848. But remember what I said about the growth of the working class in the meantime. By 1870, the majority of the national, overwhelming majority of the National Guard were working class in composition. But that poses an interesting problem for the government of national defense. Your best fighting force, which has cannon, it has rifle, and they're really keen to fight, are nothing other than the armed working class. And Marx points out, a victory of Paris over the Prussian aggressor would have been a victory of the French workmen over the French capitalist and his state parasites. And this fact, this, this was not just Marx commenting shortly after the event. Um, the, the leader, the head of the government of national defense, a man called Trochu, acknowledged this himself. He actually said, when uh, Jules Fevre wrote to him, calling on him, you know, actually go out there, fight the Prussians, he said, um, that P uh, any serious offensive measures would give the upper hand to Parisian demagoguery. In other words, if the Parisian workers were actually mobilized and sent out and scored victories against the Prussians, that would give the upper hand. In other words, if they win the war, there's a revolution. But also, if they capitulate and surrender immediately, there will be a revolution. Because the Parisian workers were prepared to overthrow any government that didn't actually defend um, you know, against the, the Prussian invasion. So how do you get yourself out of such a dilemma? If you win, there's a revolution. If you lose, there's a revolution. The way they did it was by allowing Paris to be encircled by the Prussians 
and uh, um, allowing the, them to continue a siege which cost the lives of 47,000 people, obviously overwhelmingly working class people, starving to death. I think you can imagine what a siege is like. This is a siege of a city of 2 million people. So rather than just surrendering to end the, end the war, which would have risked workers' power, or actually mobilizing the National Guard to win, they allowed them to be bled. And the reason they needed to be bled, if they were so tired and exhausted and demoralized, then maybe, maybe they just could get away with capitulating without a, a revolution. And on the 27th of January, so after four months of siege, on the 20th, 20th of September is when the siege begins, on the 27th of January, the Nat government of national defense signed an armistice with Russia, and the terms of that armistice were reparations to be paid by Paris specifically in this first instance, and, um, and for an election to be called to an election national assembly in two weeks with the country under the occupation of a foreign army for the sole purpose of negotiating peace with Bismarck. Now, the results of that election, which came in, in, in February 1871, were that two-thirds of an assembly of 630 MPs, 400 of them were monarchists, the Orleanists and the, the Legitimists. And then a, a further faction were Bonapartists, people who wanted to see uh, Louis Bonaparte put back on the throne. Um, only a tiny minority were Republicans, but Paris voted overwhelmingly for Republicans, including you know, so-called rep let radical left Republicans. 75% of the vote in Paris were for the Republicans. And this poses a bit of a problem. We start to see emerging in the country a serious class split. On the one hand, you have the elected assembly, elected under the orders of, of Bismarck, who are meeting in Bordeaux, because France is encircled. And when this assembly first met, they started chanting, long live the king. This was the first assembly ever elected under the Third Republic, chanting Long Live the King, an extremely reactionary assembly. On the other hand, you have the Par uh, Paris, which is effectively controlled at this point by the armed working class, the National Guard, who elected overwhelmingly Republican deputies and who would fight to the finish to defend the Republic. Already, the outlines of the Civil War are quite clear to be seen. But this split, this kind of geographical split, if you like, between the countryside, which tended to elect monarchist deputies and even priests themselves would come and be elected, you know, representatives of the Catholic Church. You had the countryside, which was a bit you know, more reactionary in its composition. You had the cities, which were more Republican, and then Paris at the head. This geographical demographic split was nothing other than a class split. I might add also that it wasn't that the peasantry were just completely you know, reactionary monarchists. The question of peace was skillfully used by the reactionaries. They basically said, a vote for us is a vote for peace, and enter the war, your sons won't be drafted, and they used that. It's not the case that the Paris, uh, that the, the French or any other peasantry are just permanently reactionary. This is the same French peasantry that overthrew feudalism in the uh, Great French Revolution. Uh, there, there are two sides to the French peasantry, and I'll come on to that um, in, a, in a little bit of time. So you see this class split, and this class split was clearly recognized by the ruling class themselves, and the head of this new reactionary assembly who was a man called Adolphe Thiers, who'd been involved in French politics all the way back to the 1820s. He'd seen a lot of revolutions, He'd even taken part in one in a very cynical and cowardly way, which is his way, but he was the kind of the main representative of the French bourgeoisie at this time. He himself was a monarchist, by the way, but he set himself the task. He realized, I have to give him the credit, he was incredibly cynical, a coward, uh, a dastardly human being, but he was also a very cunning representative, an intelligent and cunning representative of the ruling class. And he realized that war with Prussia is one thing, but the main issue right now is to crush the Paris workers. He'd seen 1848. He knew what was coming. And so already this assembly of monarchist deputies starts provoking and attacking the Parisians. First, there was a moratorium on rents during the siege. I guess in a way, it's kind of, it's in a funny way, kind of comparable to the moratorium on rents you saw during the pandemic. And the, the ruling class thought, well, now's the time to get rid of that. So all of a sudden, all these kind of ruined small businesses and all these workers uh, renting flats, they're told that after having almost starved to death, you all your rent's due in about two weeks. Good luck. Um, they cut the pay of the National Guard. I wonder why they might want to do that by 30, about 30 pence. But of course, that was, that was about a third of their daily wage at that time, um, which was obviously a deliberate act of provocation. Also, symbolic acts. They passed a, a resolution to move the official capital of the country from Paris to Versailles. Versailles was the capital during the old regime, during the regime prior to the Great French Revolution. It's that palace that you might have seen if you've gone and you know, visited as a, as a tourist. Um, very funny smell I've always found there. I don't know why. All the ghosts. Um, they, they started suppressing Republican newspapers. This was how the Third Republic announced itself to the world. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's another side to this story. Within Paris itself, you actually start to have an embryo, organs of workers' power development. Way back, even at the beginning of the, the First Revolution in September, 
the arrondissement of Paris, of the, di the different districts of the city, would hold big public assemblies out in the street, and they would discuss questions. What's the way forward? What's the way to defeat the enemy? What's the way to win against the, the siege and uh, you know, to defeat the Prussians? And also then, I guess, more, more local, practical tasks. Um, and they would elect delegates at these big assemblies to a central committee representing the whole of Paris. This was a Soviet. We're talking about a Paris Soviet taking place, where the working masses would come together, elect democratically elect representatives to discuss the pressing questions of the day. That came into existence as far back as September. And Trotsky, who knew a thing or two about Soviets and revolution, in 1921 wrote an introduction to the civil war in France, a Marxist pamphlet or series of addresses about the Paris Commune. And he said the following, which I find extremely interesting. He said, if the centralized party of revolutionary action had been found at the head of the proletariat of France in September 1870, the whole history of France, and with it the whole history of humanity, would have taken another direction. Why might you have thought something like this? Uh, and one clue to what he's getting at here can be found in, uh, I'm stepping back a little bit, but 31st of October 1870, there was actually an insurrection, a working class insurrection that took place before the birth of the Paris Commune where at the news that a big, one of the main French armies had been captured and surrendered to the Prussians, which suggested that the, sea, you know, the war was not going well and the siege was going to uh, continue and get worse. Actually, the, what you might describe as the vanguard, the most radical, determined section of the working class, rose up, stormed into the assembly. There's a long tradition of this in French politics. Stormed into the assembly that they had just created did, and, and called, said it was dissolved, marched to the, um, the, the Hotel de Ville, to announce a new government, which was much more radical, it included figures like um, uh, Auguste Blanqui, who was a very famous French revolutionary, who was constantly trying to provoke and carry out insurrections to overthrow uh, the ruling class in France. France. He spent most of his life in prison for doing exactly that. A determined communist revolutionary. I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about the limitations of Blanquism, though. Um, and yet, it came to nothing, unfortunately. Um, it, it, the, despite the fact that one of the heads of the government, Jules Ferry, said at that point, no one in Paris supported us. Everybody hated us. They actually fled uh, Paris at the news of this. So why is it that they lost them? Because once this kind of revolutionary power had installed itself, just by decree, it had this had not been planned. This was not a pre-planned insurrection. It was the masses had spontaneously risen up at the, this terrible news from the front. They stormed into the assembly. One member of the Central Committee of the Arrondissement that I mentioned earlier, so a, a leading member of the Paris Soviet, if you like, climbed onto, literally climbed onto a table and said, Let's overthrow the government. And, they, and they, they just did it. So that I mean, that's, that's a good sign in terms of the militancy, militancy of the workers there. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough. And when they got to the Hotel de Ville, you had supportive National Guard units. So you had armed men that could act to defend this government. But they didn't give them any instructions. They basically said they gave the impression that the job had been done. So they went home. Meanwhile, National Guard units that did still depend, defend the government of national defense. It's not that the whole population of Paris had turned against the government at that stage. They actually went and they recaptured the Hotel de Ville. It was a failure. So I can't help but ask the question that Trotsky also asked. They had a party along similar lines with the same kind of preparation and links to the masses as the Bolshevik party. What if the Bolshevik party, or you know, the French equivalent at this time, what if the Blancists, for example, had succeeded in gaining a solid majority in this central committee of the arrondissement and then started making real preparations with the most hardline revolutionary National Guard units to take strategic points in the city? I don't think the, national go uh, the government of national defense would have survived us much longer. And bear in mind that this was on the 31st of October. That means that three months of that brutal siege would not have taken place, not, let alone the other effects. So why did that party not exist? I don't have a huge amount of time to go into the history of working class movements in France, but I mentioned Blanqui, and I think I should spend a bit more time on him. Blanqui was, as I mentioned, a determined communist revolutionary. He was almost all his, his life. At the end of his life, he started to turn towards chauvinism, unfortunately, but for the majority of his life, he, was, he believed in what Marx would call the dictatorship of the proletariat. He said that basically the workers should install a revolutionary dictatorship in the capital, suppress all the resistance of the old exploiters, and use that to basically to create communism. One limitation of Blanqui was he was extremely vague about what all this meant. He, he kind of was very big into spontaneity. He basically said, well, once the mass is in power, they'll, all, they'll sort it all out. And there's an element of truth in that. We as Marxists don't believe that the working class basically just follows our direction that we set out a blueprint or a staircase to socialism. But without a clear revolutionary strategy and a plan for how a recognized party of revolution with a program that people can identify with can actually win over 
the vanguard, win over the most revolutionary section of the working class, organize them in order to take power, in order to install that class dictatorship, that was what was lacking, which was why all of Blanqui's insurrectionary attempts failed. I mentioned 1848. In May of 1848, he did exactly the same thing and wound up getting arrested. So in the decisive June insurrection, when the workers were crushed, he was missing. In October, again, he and his followers launched a failed insurrection, which could probably have succeeded if it had been carried out on the kind of lines that Trotsky and the Bolsheviks, having learned from those lessons, to be fair to Blanqui, if they had carried it out on those lines. Instead, he ends up in jail. So during the most glorious episode, one of the most glorious episodes in human history, and one of the most glorious episodes in the history of the working class, he's in jail again. This is one of the tragedies of Blanquism, that in many respects he had the right ideas, but he lacked that kind of organization and party that was necessary. Um, but what about um, the forces of Marxism? Marxism existed by the 1870s. And you had the International Working Man's Association, which had been founded in 1867. If I get my dates right. And actually it had over a thousand subs payers paying members in France. So that's more than we have in, in the IMT in France or, or in Britain for that matter today. Still relatively small. But they also, through their kind of that other organizations like workers' support societies that they ran and influenced, they, they probably influenced, historians estimate about 30,000 workers were somehow under the influence of the IWMA. That's pretty good. I'd, I'd take that. Um, so why, why was that not good enough? In actual fact, I know we associate the First International with Marx but, and, and Engels, and that, that is right, they were on the leadership, but it wasn't a Marxist international. The majority of the French section of the IWMA was dominated by Proudhonism, followers of Proudhon. Proudhon actually described himself as an anarchist. He might actually be the first person to do so. I'm not entirely sure. He was certainly one of the founders, considered the founding fathers of anarchism. And one part of his theory was that actually the working class should not struggle for, let alone take, political power. So he was opposed to the formation of a revolutionary centralized party for the seizure of power because to seize power, in his view, would be pointless. He said if you had a social revolution, and for him a social revolution was changing economic re uh, relations with cooperatives and mutual benefit societies and stuff, if you change the economic conditions, then you don't need to seize power. The political power becomes redundant. Which, you know, it sounds kind of materialist, but all the while, you basically tolerate the existence of the bourgeois state. And the bourgeois state and the ruling class that it acts for is in no way going to tolerate and accept you transforming the economy under its nose. He even actually suggested that the state might support some of these cooperatives. Now, we know from the history of the cooperative movement, and from the history of the Spanish Commune, that's not how it goes. The ruling class do not tolerate threats to their, threats to their rule. So in reality, Proudhon's anarchism was reduced to a really pale reformism. And in moments of revolution, you had people who considered themselves revolutionaries, but didn't even want to struggle for power, let alone not have the guide. At least the Blancists wanted to struggle for power. And so in reality, the IWA was more of a collection of individuals setting up you know, worker benefit societies and cooperatives than a revolutionary party in that decisive moment. Um, but one thing that's very interesting, I would say, about the Paris Commune is that we still have the, you know, the successful birth of a working class in spite of the absence of this revolutionary party. Many times in history, we've seen inspiring revolutions. Look at the Egyptian revolution, well, both of them, uh, were through Mubarak and uh, Morsi. And then the leadership is completely absent and is handed over spontaneously to people who hand power back to the military. And yet this time, even with this pretty poor leadership, I'd have to say, the workers still managed to take power. And I want to talk about the circumstances of how that took place. The, the set, I, I already mentioned the National Guard was the armed working class. Now, in addition to the Central Committee of the Arrondissement, the National Guard started electing its own representatives and its own leadership. And he had an organization called the Central Committee of the National Guard who issued, who issued the following statement on the, on the 24th of February. 2,000 delegates from the National Guard actually uh, assembled you know, in, in a gigantic assembly to elect their leadership. And one of their leaders, who was a member of the IWMA and a follow, one of the very few followers of, or limited followers of Marx and Engels in that international, um, proposed the following resolutions, which were both passed unanimously. That the National Guard only recognizes leaders elected by itself, and that the National Guard protests against any attempt at disarmament and declares that in any case of need, it will offer armed resistance. So you have the armed workers of Paris saying, we only answer to our own leaders, and if you try to take our arms off of us, we're going to fight you. And then you have a, an assembly which is doing whatever it can to starve and defeat the Paris workers. From that moment, from February, in reality, the civil war has already begun. What we have actually is a situation which Trotsky described in his history of the Russian Revolution as dual power. Now, what is dual power? Effectively, it's two powers, doesn't it? It means that you effectively have two political powers, two state powers representing different classes within the same social formation. So within the same country, within the same national border of France, you have the bourgeois government, 
which has been elected by universal suffrage across the whole country. It has possession of the army, or what was left of it. It has the possession of the judges, the courts. It's still very much a power in society. And then you have the National Guard, who have already announced that they're not going to tolerate any impositions by the bourgeois government. This cannot last for a very long period of time, as Trotsky explained. Either the workers, the organs of workers' power that are developing will overthrow the old regime, or they will be crushed by the old regime. They can't live together in harmony. Workers' power and, and capitalist rule cannot live together, uh, which is something that was confirmed, of course, in the Russian revolutions, the German revolutions, throughout the history of the working class. And eventually, this, this stalemate, this very tense stalemate, is resolved not by the workers, who lack the leadership to take the initiative and actually plan for the insurrection, but by the ruling class itself. Thiel, when he finally feels himself strong enough, he tries to overthrow the commune using a, a coup, a sneaky, a very sneaky manoeuvre. About three o'clock in the morning on the 18th of March, you're probably thinking, finally, half an hour in, we've actually got to the 18th of March. Um, on three, at three o'clock in the morning, the, the army of, of Versailles marches from Versailles to Paris, occupies several strategic points, including the, the Great Hill, the Bouton Montmartre, where now the Sacre Coeur Cathedral is, but before there was some cannon that was actually owned, bought and paid for by the National Guard itself. Um, they go to these strategic locations in order to snatch the cannon away, in order to deprive the National Guard of some means of defense. They were going to plaster placards saying order is being reimposed. Those of you who have nothing to fear, go home. It's only your leaders we're after, you know, classic coup language. Uh, and then, you know, they were going to reimpose order, order by the sword, just like Louis Napoleon Bonaparte back in 1851. The problem is, in one of these, you know, kind of delightful accidents of history, which contain so much significance, when they finally got there, that there was hardly any resistance. The, the National Guard, who had basically declared, we're not going to follow your rule anymore, hadn't posted any guards, really. It's as if they weren't expecting this, which again shows a certain amount of the, the limitations. And dare I say, with the benefit of hindsight, the naivety of the leadership of the National Guard, they walk into Paris. One person notices them. They immediately cut him down. He's the first casualty of the commune. They get to the cannon, job done. Except somebody then realizes that they've forgotten to bring harnesses to strap the cannon to the horses. So unless they were going to push them back to Versailles themselves, they were stuck. So they had to, and they couldn't send text by that at that point either. So they had to send a messenger back to get the harnesses back in order to move the cannon. So by seven o'clock, they'd stood there twiddling their thumbs at all these strategically you know, obtained points. And that's when things start getting really interesting. Because it's at that point that the working women of Paris start to wake up for the day. Um, and as they do so, and as they come out into the street, they notice that they have the, all these uniformed troops standing around the cannon. And they start harassing them, start calling out to them. They say, what are you doing? I think I've got a quote. It says, what, what is this? This is, uh, uh, this is shameful. What are you doing there? And the, the soldiers stand there in silence. Their commander, uh, General Lecomte, who was given command over this operation, eventually, the, the women, sorry, I've missed a piece here. The women go and wake up their husbands, the National Guardsmen with the rifles who were still in bed at this point, uh, not exactly on alert for a coup attempt. They wake them up, drag them into the street, and they start fraternizing with the soldiers. Again, we've seen this a number of times in revolutions throughout history. That actually, the working people of Paris are calling to the soldiers saying, what are you doing here? All we've done is started electing our own, you know, our, our own representatives. We're, we're not posing a threat to anybody. The soldiers are, are listening to this. You can see that, the, you know, the general can see it's going to go one way or another. He orders the soldiers to fire on the crowd, including men, women, and children. And the soldiers stand still. They don't do anything. He orders again and again. Possibly again, I'm not sure it was three or four times. And then his own soldiers turn around and point their guns at him. They mutiny. And this happens all across the, society, uh, the city. So without shedding a drop of blood, the working class took power in Paris almost by accident. Of course, this accident underlies, it expresses a much deeper necessity, which is what I would say. I would say that the working class was already in control of Paris by this point. It just required the bayonet of Thiers and the Versailles to pop that bubble to suddenly realize, actually, no, we're in charge here. The only casualty, aside from that century I mentioned, the only casualties of the 18th of March insurrection was the general Lecomte and um, another reactionary general, Clément Thomas, who had been, actually carried out, been partly responsible for the massacre in June 1848, hated by the workers. He was in disguise. He was in civilian clothes, trying to see how it was going. They caught him, and the mutiny soldiers dragged both Clément Thomas and Lecomte to the Hôtel de Ville and executed him on the spot. The representatives of the National Guard um, Central Committee actually said they should stand court-martial. So 
all of these lies and calumnies about the bloodthirst of the masses, the bloodthirst of the Bolsheviks, and when the working class finally take power, they're going to massacre all the bourgeoisie just out of jealousy, out of spite. It's complete nonsense. Every time the working class has taken power, they've shown immense magnanimity. And if anything, actually, if you don't mind me saying, they've been too magnanimous and too soft and an enemy that would much rather see them all uh, executed against the wall. In reality, Le Comte and Clément Thomas got the treatment that Thiers had been preparing, that they had been preparing for the Paris workers. While this was all going on, so about by about noon, the representatives of the government, Thiers actually was in Paris at this time. He was trying to coordinate the coup. And when he started getting bad news, he immediately fled the city, as he has done when any problem is on the horizon. Um, in every single revolution in the 19th century, he fled Paris, every single one. Um, even ones that he supposedly led. And um, meanwhile, uh, Jules uh, Fevre, I think it was, he was still in the office at the Hotel de Ville. He, he wasn't quite as cunning as Thiers. He hadn't got the bad news yet. And so when he realized the National Guard were coming, he had to jump out of a window and escape from Paris. Now, what was the leadership of the insurrection doing? What was the equivalent of Trotsky and you know, the Revolutionary Military Committee planning the, the insurrection all night? They were still in bed. They didn't realize that, that the insurrection had happened until they, they came out and they met at the Hotel de Ville and they realized they were in power. Again, I have to ask the question, would, it have gone, would things have gone differently if they'd been, you know, if they'd been prepared for this, if they put uh, guards, for example? But we can speculate. I, you know, we can move on from that. The point is that the working class found this in, itself in power. And what did it start doing with this, that power? This is the really, uh, you know, the, perhaps the most important lesson of all from the commune. Marx makes a very interesting statement. He says that the, um, if I can actually find it, that... He says, the working class did not expect miracles from the commune. They had no ready-made utopias to introduce by decree of the people. They have no ideals to realize but to set free the elements of the new society with which old, collapsing bourgeois society is itself pregnant. In other words, the social transformation of society is not something that is, you know, you, some genius writes up a blueprint and then we tell the workers what to do. In actual fact, the trans socialist transformation of society is a practical question. That when you put power in the hands of the working class and they themselves start to democratically and rationally confront the problems facing society at this time, they will achieve miracles. They will perform miracles. And that's exactly what the Paris Commune was, despite all these limitations and problems. Uh, you know, all, all the limitations that I talked about. Some of the political measures of the Commune. Immediately, one of the first measures of the Commune was to abolish the standing army. Now, in reality, the stand, standing army barely existed at this point. Um, and, and what they did was they made the, the National Guard the army, effectively. But this was a, a militia which democratically elected its own leaders. It was, a, it was the armed working class it became the armed force of society. That makes the Paris Commune different to any other state that's ever existed in history. It makes it a, a much more democratic, and it makes it a truly proletarian state. Abolition of the bureaucracy. That actually, if you perform the function, so what, the way the Commune was built up, it was, it was not that dissimilar to a council, to be honest, like a local authority, but with obviously with a lot more power and a lot more democratic. But the, the workers would elect delegates, so from their local assemblies, they would elect delegates to the central council of the commune. But there was only one chamber, it wasn't like a legislative and, uh, you know, two chambers legislature or, or a separation of powers between the legislative and the executive. Marx describes it as a working body. And actually is an important function of workers' democracy. Because basically, if you were appointed to perform a job, if you were going to represent the workers on that council, or if you were appointed to be an official in charge of a certain department, like the Department of Labor or, or even the post office, you were accountable to the workers. You could be recalled. You're not only elected, you could be recalled at any time if you weren't doing your job. This is, this is how universal suffrage should really work in a genuine democracy, a workers' democracy. Marx said that for the workers, universal suffrage would serve them in the same way that individual suffrage serves the, the bosses. So what that means is when the boss thinks a worker isn't doing his or her job properly or isn't making enough money, they'll sack them. That's individual suffrage. When the workers don't think you are doing your job properly, they'll sack you. And I think that's perfectly fair enough. If only we could do that under bourgeois democracy, if only we could sack the representatives and the unelected officials, I'd love to sack the Queen. Maybe one day we will. I don't know how much longer we've got, to be honest. Maybe we should hurry up. But, it, you know, it, we, I'd happily sack Charles or William or any of them, to be honest. I don't, I don't discriminate. But or, or the, the, the upper echelons of the British civil service, they're not elected. Although, in a way, actually, I'll, I'll, that's a mistake. They are elected. They're elected by the city of London. They are themselves from the city of London. They're representatives of the ruling class, helping to manage the affairs of the, of the state, which the government, I think Marx himself said, the, the, the present day executive is just a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie. Well, this was a committee, a council, for managing the common affairs of the proletariat. 
and that made it fundamentally different from any state that's ever existed in history. And if you were elected to one of these posts, if you were elected to the council or you appointed, uh, you know, elected to one of these official positions, you didn't earn a salary more than just an average worker's wage. The salaries were capped at 6,000 francs, which at that time was kind of, a, you know, a decent worker's wage, but a worker's wage nonetheless. So they weren't on the breadline, but they didn't have the privileges of the bureaucracy. They weren't uh, drawing the equivalent of a hundred, you know, six-figure salary that you have many, many people at the tops of these various state bureaucracies drawing, uh, whose job is not really to carry out these services, but rather just to, to make sure they're being carried out in a way that's amenable to the capitalist system. Uh, you also had democratic uh, demands being carried out, the separation from the church and the state. In France at that time, the church actually controlled education at pretty much all levels, and still the Catholic Church had a, a big role to play in the state. I mentioned that a section of the MPs were themselves uh, you know, priests and representatives of the church. That was done away with. They didn't abolish religion or the church. They didn't go on a, a, you know, a rampage of sacking churches or anything. In fact, some churches were voluntarily converted into meeting halls and assembly halls, and they drape a red flag over the altar and then debate questions of the day. Um, you know, again, this is what we see in scenes of revolution, the masses really entering onto the stage of history. But instead, they, they carried out what I would say is a basic democratic demand, which is the separation of the church and state, something that has yet to be carried out here to this day. They introduced free education for everybody. Now, that's something that has been sort of won under, under capitalism and is now being rolled back in many respects. But this was immediate. As soon as the workers come to power, these really important democratic demands, which have been held back by the ruling class, were immediately granted. Those are the political elements of the commune, which in and of themselves, if, if that is all they'd achieved, then that would you know, by far justify us having a much longer discussion than this about the commune. However, that's not all they achieved. Marx made an interesting point that actually these political reforms in this worker state was the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economic emancipation of labor. And it was to serve as a lever for uprooting the economic foundation upon rest, which rests the existence of classes, so not even just capitalism, and therefore class rule itself. That big talk. So what did they, how, how did they manage that? How did they use this political form to, you know, as a lever to completely transform society? Again, they, they did it in practice. They, they, they were confronted with such problems as all of the, you know, the main bureaucrats, the, the post office, the, uh, the, the street lamps, even the cemeteries. The run, everything to do with the running of the city had been deliberately sabotaged. So the old management had fled, but while they fled, they took all the cash from the register and they smashed all the stamps, and they made it impossible, basically, to run the, uh, the, uh, the, the city. So what did the workers do? They didn't give up hope. What they did was they started electing their own managers, and they, they got to work. Because the thing is, the workers that worked in the post office knew much better how to run the post office than the managers. And I think anyone who's worked in any job knows that's the case. But the people who work doing the job have a better idea about how to do the job than the people who tell them to do the job, and uh, whose job is basically to manage how they make profit. So they appointed managers democratically under the terms in which I explained earlier. And um, if sometimes administrators from, the old, administrators from the old regime were still in place, and if they put up obstacles, then the workers would use their own initiative to basically get the job done anyway. And so in the post office, they reconstituted the post office and even started successfully smuggling posts out of the city, despite a blockade, in the space of two days. Even more inspiring, I got a bit more detail about the print workers. So the, the print industry was vital for producing information for the workers, you know, leaflets, pamphlets, papers. The bourgeois had, had tried to destroy that. But when the workers took charge, they increased the workers' salaries by 25%. But at the same time, they saved the printers at printing office 200 francs a day. So they increased the workers' wages, but lowered the budget by cutting the enormous salaries of the highest officials. I can't help but think that, that sounds like quite a good idea. You know, that, that's one form of austerity that I can get behind, I think. But actually, it was even more efficient than that. It wasn't just kind of more fair. It worked better. That the budget of the printing office uh, up to the 18th of March was 120,000 francs a month. Under the commune, it was never more than 20,000 francs a month. In other words, the work was being done more efficiently because the purpose of the work was to meet the needs of the inhabitants of Paris. It made things so much simpler and therefore cheaper. Marx makes a kind of wry remark. He says that it made the, the fantasy of the liberals, cheap government, a reality. And it, I can't, like, I mean, I'm already running out of time, but I can't help but think of the crisis in the NHS today. The people always say, oh, we can't just perpetually pump money into this gigantic bureaucracy. People are getting older, the population is getting larger. Surely it's a fantasy. I believe that if the workers, who actually, the NHS workers themselves, however many there are, like hundreds of thousands of skilled workers who know what they're doing and are passionate about what they're doing, if they were given democratic control of how to run the health service in the context of a country where profiteering pharmaceutical companies had also been put under the control of society as a whole and the working class, not only would everybody be guaranteed decent health care, 
are not long waiting times at any Amy, are not dying for lack of a ventilator or things like that. Not only would be able to face up to COVID more effectively, but I bet it would cost less as well. Because this whole you know, parasitic layer of management designed basically to carry out cuts, ironically, whilst drawing these salaries themselves, wouldn't be there. Anyway, I better hurry up. But that's one way in which they started transforming the bedrock of society itself. They also, again, what you might call kind of, I guess, minimal demands for the working class, banning night work. Uh, you know, many industries had long night shifts, which were very detrimental to health. They banned that. They banned fines on workers' wages. They registered all the abandoned factories when the bourgeois had left. They registered them and put them under the control of workers' associations, under basically workers' cooperatives. In other words, just out of practical necessity, the workers were creating the basis for socialism. This is what we mean by the socialist transformation of society. They halted foreclosures of mortgages, so they protected property owners, and they deferred payments of rent. So they overturned that policy of forcing people to pay rent that they clearly couldn't afford. And within this, there are other, there are other important points to be raised, that within this, you also have the role of women. Now, because I'm already running out of time, I can't dwell, and I'm sure people will come in on this question and the, and the, and the discussion. Now, one of the mistakes of the commune is that they didn't um, give the vote to the women. It was universal male suffrage. That was a mistake based on, again, you know, prejudices exist in that society. But I am absolutely convinced that if the commune had been given more than 10 weeks to live, then women would have been given the vote, would have won the vote, not just simply been passively given the vote, because at every single stage in the life of the commune, the women were on the front line, literally, as well as metaphorically. They were the ones that effectively began the commune on the morning of 18th of March. They're the ones who actually fought on the barricades alongside the men. Some were, uh, you know, ambulance carriers. Some were nurses. But some actually, you know, were, were there with rifles getting shot down in the commune. And then when the commune was eventually crushed, they were there being shot, shot up against the wall just like everybody else. It got to the, the, the Times, as in the Times, the English Times, not a Bolshevik publication. It, it commented in one of its articles that if the French nation were composed only of French women, what a terrible nation it would be. And by, by terrible, they meant terrifying. But it, it, they, they showed, you know, the courage, the ferocity of the working women defending their class and defending their own interests along with it, despite the fact that they've been, I would say, mistakenly, wrongly deprived of the vote. And we see this, you know, many times in the minor strike. We see actually how the class struggle and the struggle for the emancipation of women. And it's not even that they, you know, intersect or coalesce. They are the same struggle ultimately. And the class is the class struggle that opens the way for the true ultimate liberation. Of, of women and, and all oppressed groups in society. But, and also this was an internationalist body. You know, I mentioned earlier about the chauvinism, you know, this defenses and this mood of defense, that dissipated. You had Poles, you had Hungarians, you had Russians take, playing an active part, even being elected to the leadership of the commune, even leading armies of the commune. You had people from all sorts of com, uh, com, uh, countries and the commune itself announced that our flag, the red flag, is the flag of the world republic. That is the internationalism that we stand on to this day. That is our heritage. But I, to, to, to kind of close up, the, the commune did make mistakes. I mean, it, it was always hard pressed. It was always in difficult circumstances. I can't stand here that it would, oh, it would definitely won if it hadn't made these mistakes, but it would have had a lot better chance. The first mistake, which Marx cried, you know, he, he, you can see him in his letters pulling his beard out about this, was when the Versailles had been defeated on the 18th of March, and they were trickling out of the city, demoralized, defeated, in disorder, on the point of mutiny. The commune, uh, the, the, the National Guard did not follow them. If the, com if the National Guard had, had marched on Versailles, I'm sure that they would have probably won over some of those units, dispersed what remained of the army even more, maybe even captured the government. Who knows, maybe even captured Thiers. That in and of itself wouldn't have suddenly ended the civil war. But the crucial thing is it would have bought them time. It would have broken the isolation, bought them time to try and reach out more to the country. And who knows, maybe we'll be having a different kind of discussion about the commune today. Another mistake they made is that the Bank of France, as you probably imagine, was sat in Paris. And Lissa Garay, who wrote a very interesting, fantastic history of the commune, he was there, he participated in it. He said that every single revolutionary history, when they have had the chance, has taken hold of the treasury and the bank. Uh, and the bank. Julius Caesar did it. I don't know if he's a revolutionary, but in the in this Roman Civil War, he took hold of the treasury because he could use the gold to pay his troops. Um, what did the commune do? The commune sent a guy called Bezle, who was himself capitalist, but was all in favor of the reconciliation, reconciliation of the classes. He'd stood for the commune. He went over to the Bank of France, and the governor of the Bank of France had already fled because he thought that he was going to get the guillotine. And the, assist, the deputy government basically said, don't touch the bank. If you touch the bank, then all of the currency in France, the paper currency, will become worthless. Don't destroy the national wealth. In other words, don't destroy French capitalism by doing this. And so Bezelay came back and said, we can't do it. We can't touch the bank. And so the first worker state in history 
allowed the Bank of France to continue paying the wages of the same troops that shot them down in April and May. It's a, it's a tragedy. Now, taking the bank wouldn't have immediately resulted in the creation of socialism, but I think it probably would have disrupted the plans of the reactionary armies a little bit longer. Again, it would have built, uh, bought them time. And they would have, you know, there were jewels, um, gold in, in the, the, the vaults of the, the treasury that they could have used. Finally, when they took over the city hall, there were secret records going back all the way to the days of Napoleon I there that they took hold of, and they didn't do anything with them. They didn't make copies. They didn't send them out to another country to be published. They didn't even take them hostage. Mark says, if they, if they had basically started publishing these things, you know, the dirty dealings of the ruling class for about 100 years, then that itself could have been a hostage in the hands of the revolutionaries. That could have also bought them time. It also could have opened the eyes of the, of the working masses of the world. So, like I said, the dirty dealings of the ruling class. They didn't. And the reason they did it, didn't, is they worried that if they did, that it would exacerbate the civil war, that it would be a provocation that would make matters worse. In other words, the leadership of the commune didn't realize that their very existence was the worst insult and the worst crime they could have possibly committed against the ruling class. And that whatever was going to happen, Thiers and the Versailles were going to come in and they were going to massacre them indiscriminately, regardless of what they did. Um, and, you know, these, these mistakes, we must celebrate the glory of the commune, but we also need to learn from these mistakes. And so the commune was, as you, as you know, defeated. They started fighting on the 2nd of April. On the 21st of May, the Versailles troops managed to enter into the city, and then you have what's called Bloody Week. For seven days, you had relentless, brutal barricade fighting, where the workers basically set up barricades in their own uh, neighborhoods. And the Versailles basically swept, but went from barricade to barricade, bombed indiscriminately into the city uh, using artillery, artillery cannon from the fortresses. Thiers even boasted how, oh, we've crushed an entire district of Paris. So they weren't coming to save Paris, they were coming to destroy it. In their eyes, it had to be destroyed. When a barricade was captured, and, uh, and the National Guardsmen were captured, they were immediately put up against the wall and shot. The, the drunken soldiers would even shoot anyone for wearing a watch and then would loot their body. Any woman wearing ragged clothes or, wear, or carrying like a, you know, a, a, a pail, you know, a container, a vessel, would be shot as a suspected arsonist. They, they spread this myth of the petroleurs. They were basically, the, the poor women in the city were deliberately burning down buildings and stuff like that. The whole city was converted into a vision of hell. 20,000 people were killed during that fighting, including many innocent people. After that, um, 2,000 people died in prisons. They were thrown in effectively dungeons. Children, a child of seven, pregnant women were thrown in there who then miscarried or gave birth to stillborn children. It was like a vision of hell. Why did they commit such atrocity? What this, what, another lesson that we have to learn is it doesn't matter how democratic it is, it doesn't matter how civilized it is or how liberal it is, the ruling class will stop at nothing to destroy any possibility of class rule. And the reason they were so ferocious and they committed atrocities far beyond what they'd ever committed was because they realized that the, the workers who'd risen up in the Paris Commune represented the living memory of the working class struggle in France. They'd remembered 1848. They'd learned lessons from this. So if they were allowed to live, then you're basically guaranteeing another successful commune further down the line. So they had to be exterminated. And they were. A, to a total of 30,000 people were killed in the course of those events. And then thousands more were deported to New Caledonia. Later on, 100,000 people were missing from the electoral roll in Paris. Those, not all those people were killed, but that's the imp impact on the prison population. Capitalists, businesses were complaining they didn't have enough workers because they shot them all. That shows actually the interests of the, the ruling class are not entirely economic. They're not, they're not like this crude kind of eco economism, but they also have political interests and are prepared to do whatever it takes to, uh, to safeguard them. So anyway, I better, I better finish up because I've gone on too long already. Um, but I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Today, if you go to Paris as a tourist, and I'm sure many of you already have, if you travel to Montmartre or watch the, you know, the enchanting film Amélie, you will feel, see the, the Basilica of the Sacre Coeur at the top of that hill. That was the hill where the cannon was sat, where um, Le Comte tried to seize the cannon and was uh, you know, overthrown by his mutinous troops. There was no cathedral there. That is the birthplace of the commune. After the commune was crushed and massacred, they put that cathedral there, not to, not to appeal to God for forgiveness, for their massacring and deporting the workers. It was to appeal, you know, to, to ask forgiveness for the murder of Le Comte and Clement Thomas, the, the reactionary generals who were planning and um, massacring the workers. I think it's very apt that they chose for the architecture a Roman-style basilica, because it was a revolt of the slave owners against the democratic working-class future of humanity. That's their monument. That's the monument to the Third Republic. So the commune, if you go to the quiet Père Lachaise Cemetery, in an isolated corner, you can find a dignified mural 
So the communards, uh, uh, some of the communards were shot by that very wall. And you can see a, just a plaque commemorating their sacrifice and their movement. But to be honest, the commune doesn't need a mural even. It doesn't need a monument. It certainly doesn't need a cathedral. It doesn't need any monument of bronze or stone. What it, what it needs is a living monument. We must build a living monument to the commune. The revolutionary forces of Marxism. The Marxism itself was actually, it was, the Marxist program was itself contributed to by the experience and the lessons of the commune. Marx said, he'd actually hypothesized the dictatorship of the proletariat way back in, in the 1850s. But he said, this was it. He, he said, the work, French workers have shown the way. Lenin, in 1905, uh, you know, in, in the midst of the 1905 revolution, said that um, the cause of the commune is the social revolution and that future struggles, the present movement, we all stand on the shoulders of the commune. And I'd, I would point to, if those of you who have studied the Russian Revolution, study with the Paris Commune in mind. Because I would say that every single mistake I pointed out uh, about the, you know, the mistakes of the Commune, Lenin and Trotsky deliberately, I believe consciously, they would have read this, deliberately sought to overcome. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Bolsheviks were so successful. That is the tradition. That is the heritage that we stand on. The, 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 the successes, as well as the lessons of the Commune, is our own priceless heritage. We ignore it at our peril. The Paris workers have already shown the way. Let's finish the job. Forward to socialism. Thank you. Vive la commune.